sih sebenarnya. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. And today, Heidi, we have a wonderful co-host with us, Alan Peterson, Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends. It is an honor to be with you both today. Always, I love the way Compassionate Friends and Open to Hope work together to provide resources like today with our television programs and our webinars for folks who are grieving. We try to give really good grief information, and I think we're going to have a good program today too so thank you for the honor I always appreciate working with uh, my two favorite doctors ah, so yes excited. we love we love when Alan can come on and you know he's co-hosted a lot of our shows with us and it's always wonderful to have him here Enjoy. and also I love it because he always sings for us and you're yes. gonna sing what are you gonna sing for us on this I'm gonna one? sing thanks for the little while oh, it's one of my like favorite that. songs that I wrote and it's kind of a song of gratitude and I think uh, sometimes we need to remember that even as dark as it is, we can still find gratitude yep. and in memories. And forgiveness and gratitude are some things that you're going to find out about on the show today from a very special guest that we have on. And we are going to be talking about grief and exploring the invisible world. Heidi and I were talking this morning, Alan, about the fact that one thing, as for your brief parent and a brief sibling, mm -hmm. that we know is that people are concerned about how they died, maybe, you know, were they in pain, uh, are they happy now, you know, we know those questions come up a lot. Well, they? that was my biggest question when Scott died. I mean, Scott and Matthew died at 17 together, my cousin and my brother, and, you know, the car hydroplaned and it, it blew up basically, and they, they died very traumatically. And I think one of my concerns was, was he okay at the end, and is he at peace now? Mm -hmm. You know, because it was a traumatic thing, and so I was kind of stuck in that for a very long time, not knowing the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's common for a lot of people, and mm -hmm. the one thing I like about what we do in our, in our programs is to have individuals tell their story, what, what, what brings them peace, what, what works for them, and to explore that wide range, because it's different for so many people, and I think today uh, there's going to be a lot of people that relate to the of what we're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Heidi, why don't you introduce our guest okay. and give us a I little would, more. I would love to because he has done a lot and it's very exciting to have him on today. His name is Dr. Matthew McKay and he wrote a book called Seeking Jordan. Uh, Dr. McKay is the director of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic in San Francisco and the director of the Berkeley Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Clinic and he is a professor at the Wright Institute. Welcome to the show, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Matt. It's Thank great you. to have you on. And I uh, was approached by your publisher because you have written this amazing book called Seeking Jordan, correct? Mm -hmm. And it is an awesome book about your son and your experience of actually writing it with him, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that and tell us, uh, well, first of all, tell our audience what happened to Jordan. Mm -hmm. Uh, eight years ago, Jordan was uh, riding his bike home. Uh, it was late at night. He's coming home from work. And um, four men attacked him, pulled him off his bike, probably to try to steal the bike. There's a tremendous physical fight. Uh, eventually, he broke away from them, began running down the street, and one of them shot him in the back. Wow. Uh, he managed to make it to a doorway and uh, died. Uh, in the doorway, uh, mm -hmm. pounding on the door, oh, trying awesome. to get help. Mm -hmm. wow. And, and so, how old was he at the time? 23. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I was really relating to what you were saying about um, we, we all want to know, is that, that loved one, is that soul okay? Yeah. Uh, first of all, does that soul still exist? Mm -hmm. and, and are they okay? And that was for me immediately, uh, with the shock of grief, came those two questions. Mm -hmm. Is Jordan st still here in some way? And in spite of the horror and the trauma of the way he died, is he still, is he okay? Yep. So those are, the, the, those are the questions that haunted me and sort of set me out on a, on a journey to find him. And I like that haunted me because they really do haunt us. That's yeah. a, a good word. Yeah, yeah so the journey um, began uh, some months later when I went to Chicago to see uh, 
Dr. Alan Botkin, who developed a very interesting way of, of contacting those on the other side. It's called induced after death communication, and it uses a, a treatment that I'm familiar with that I use all the time called EMDR, mm -hmm. eye movement desensitization yeah. or processing. Yeah, where you basically track uh, something back and forth and while you're thinking of a traumatic memory yeah. and somehow we're not exactly sure how it happens but the brain can't process both the memory at that intensity and track right is that kind of you know there are a lot of theories about EMDR but you know one theory is just that uh, a lot of traumas including loss is uh, stored in implicit memory on the right side of the brain and then we need the verbal uh, mm -hmm. part of our brain on the left side to actually process this and EMDR facilitates mm -hmm. uh, communication between the two sides of the brain. But however it works, uh, Botkin, when he uh, was using it, used it at the VA for years with, uh, with vets, uh, many of whom had traumatic losses. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. and, or it's seen horrible things. And it's seen horrible things and so he was using EMDR just to treat trauma. And one day he made a little mistake in the protocol and um, uh, this vet had a, a reaction he'd never seen before. The vet had had, uh, had a, a young girl he befriended in Vietnam. Her name was Lee, and uh, she was actually uh, hit by a grenade and died in his arms, and, mm -hmm. and he was going to adopt her and bring her back to the city. This man had never recovered from this loss. He just carried it uh, at this, this enormous weight of pain. And um, suddenly, uh, he just had a full vision of Lee and, and, and she, she, he heard her, he saw her, she had very specific things to tell him. She told him she loved him and was grateful for all he'd done for her. And he, he was, I, the man, the, he walked out a thousand pounds lighter. He mm -hmm. was just, uh, the, the, the pain and the grief uh, really resolved uh, at that moment. And so Bakken didn't know what he'd done. He, he, looking back, he saw, oh, wait a minute, I made this little strange uh, error in the protocol. And then he did it uh, without telling any of the next uh, 83 vets. He, he didn't, mm -hmm. all of whom had traumatic loss, and uh, didn't tell them what to expect. They just thought they were getting EMDR to treat trauma. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, 81 of the 83 had uh, direct contact with their loved one on wow. the other side. Uh, so without any foreknowledge, uh, they all, uh, 81 out of 83, had, mm -hmm. a, had an amazing experience. So I went to Chicago to see what that was. And you about. knew about him before Jordan died? I knew, I knew about him before Jordan died because I do EMDR. And, and you knew that little story. And I knew, I knew the, the, the story. I knew the research. I'd read his book, actually. Yeah. So, you know, and, and uh, so when I went to Chicago, my wife and I were hopeful of making contact with Jordan. And while she didn't hear from him, I did. I had an experience of, of hearing him as clearly as we are mm -hmm. hearing each other. I mean, yeah. his voice was there. He had very specific things to, to say to me. And he said the two things that I needed to know. He, he said he, he was, first of all, he, that he was not only st still conscious and existing, but he was watching over us. He was aware of us. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly what was going on. Uh, and he was in a very good place, a very happy place. So that was tremendous shift in, in my grief. It wasn't, I still d deeply struggled with not being able to hold my boy, not being able to talk mm -hmm. to my boy in, 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 in embodied, but I, but I had heard his voice and mm -hmm. it, it made a huge difference. It, mm -hmm. uh, it lightened the pain quite mm -hmm. a bit. So that was the first step. I, li I like the, the lighten the pain I did because these things aren't just, wow, okay, now life is great. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So th that was a first step, and, and I think it, my initial reaction was, you know, again the relief, uh, a lightness, but also a certain frustration because it was there was no way to have a conversation. There was no way to actually mm -hmm. engage with him, uh, to ask questions and mm -hmm. hear hear answers back. And um, so I went to see. Uh, uh, another uh, doctor, uh, you know, a psychologist who specializes in after-death communication, Ralph Metzner. And um, Metzner is, is in San Rafael here in the Bay Area. And Metzner did a number of things. But very early on, he taught me how to do uh, channel writing or automatic writing, mm -hmm. which turns out, in my experience, to be relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't require, I mean, I am not clear audience. I have, I have no powers, uh, mediumship powers at all. 
um, I was surprised to find that the first time I did it, I, I, I was able to get pretty direct communications from Jordan. And, and, and I know you talk for uh, our audience. He talks directly how to do it and talks about this in his book, Seeking Jordan. So they're going to want to get that and take a look at what you mm -hmm. did. But now, as I remember, you got an item that Yeah, well, what, what Ralph taught me to do is that um, basically you want to get something, a physical object that connects you to that person you love. It could be something they gave you or something that they had. Um, so you need an item. For me, it was just a little business card that Jordan had, had printed up when he was in high school, and it said Jordan McKay, CEO of Omega Technologies. And uh, of course, there was no Omega Technologies. He was, <laughs> he was a clever boy. He was getting using it to get into all these trade shows and, <laughs> and, and get a lot of free stuff. And so, um, so, but that little card is very uh, dear to me because it's it's his humor and his audacity mm -hmm. and. So that was the, that's the physical object I use. You need something for eye fixation. So the easiest thing is just to use a candle. And, um, uh, and that's, that's part of it. I love of it, a candle. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. very, very cool. easy. Yeah. And um, the, the eye fixation part um, is simply just to kind of get your, your attention on one thing and kind of quiet your mind a little bit. Um, then the next thing is just, uh, you know, there's different ways of, of, of getting into a receptive state. I mean, you can use auto-hypnosis, uh, you know, self-hypnosis, which is pretty easy to do. I use just a Vipassana meditation, just um, uh, note my breath, say in on the in-breath, out on the in-breath, out-breath. When there's thought, there's a thought, but let me get back to my breath, just focusing on mm -hmm. the breath and noticing thoughts, letting them go, and quieting the mind. And um, when I get quiet enough, I, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a visualization you can use now, and you can just imagine a kind of a star of light just above your head, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. divination Ralph taught me. And you just imagine that star of light, and gradually it just expands into an orb, mm -hmm. uh, the color of the sun. You're, you're visualizing that almost as a mirror uh, image of the candle that you're mm -hmm. looking at. And, and that is kind of the channel <laughs> that opens up uh, mm -hmm. to the communication. And, and then I'll just have a you know, an awareness of Jordan. I, I'm now noticing I'm receptive. You always have to have something to write on. Uh, mm -hmm. So I write the first question, whatever the first question is, and I wait. And um, What was your first question? Do you remember? Uh, are you okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he said more than you can ever know. Wow. Uh, and, um, that must have been incredible to hear that. That was a beautiful moment. I, mm -hmm. I could... And um, and I I had lots of questions, and in the beginning, and, and I think most people experience this when they first start doing automatic writing, the the answers they get are kind of short, you know. So mm -hmm. there there are a few words sometimes, and maybe a sentence, um, and that's fine. When the when you, you wait for the answer to come, you listen to the first word or two, wait for the sentence to be completed. Is there more? Yes, no, and at a certain point. Uh, there's a quietness, and you write your next question, and, mm -hmm. and now you write down the answers as they show up. And after a while, it's possible to get a lot more elaborate, and, mm -hmm. and the questions el elicit very um, significant amount of information. And, and at one, one point, uh, Ralph suggested uh, to, to me that maybe I should write a book with George because I, I was, was getting a lot say of information. You had, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I mean, it never occurred to me. I mean, I, it's the last thing that I would have ever thought of. And I asked Jordan, and he uh, said, fine, no, absolutely, I'm, I'm all for it. And, and, and then in the next five minutes, just outlined the whole book, every chapter, and exactly oh. what was going to be in it. I could, I could hardly write uh, fast enough to keep up with all the information. And that's so one of the interesting things. When he's communicating with you, is it, it's through the writing, right? That's that's basically okay. how he's communicating you to me. Although I have other ways of communicating, and I could tell you about that in a minute. But yes, through the writing, okay. um, and you know, the book was you know, I would say, sixty percent of the book is his, and mm -hmm. and I just simply transcribed uh -huh. what he said. I asked questions about the nature of the universe, why we're here, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there were some great answers in there, but I want to ask you what's coming up from now when I think about it. You've written other books. You've been involved with many things. You've been in the mm -hmm. therapy business. 
did you have a pause to think, would I really dare write this book? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, right in the middle of the book, um, when I was maybe just a little over halfway finished, I, I kind of went into a funk, and mm -hmm. I was uh, struggling, and not only as far as the book was concerned, mm -hmm. but I was actually feeling very detached from my life. I, 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 you know, I felt less engaged with being a therapist, a teacher, all the things I was doing, which are meaningful to me and mm -hmm. very, very deeply matter to me. And yet, uh, I was finding myself uh, just kind of floating outside of it all uh, without uh, a great deal of interest. And, uh, and I, I didn't know what to make of it. And um, so um, I, I did a... Another piece of this is that years ago, long before Jordan died, I learned to do um, past life and between life regressions, and uh, I did it with, a lot, done it with quite a few people. Um, but I'd never had the experience of, of having a regression myself. I had mm -hmm. helped others, but I'd never had it myself. And so Ralph uh, Metzner did start doing that with me. So now I, I was getting an, the experience of actually visiting the afterlife. Uh, and, and connecting with Jordan in the afterlife, you know, via essentially hypnosis, mm -hmm. um, and having conversations there, and and so that was another way I was learning to communicate with Jordan. And so when I had complicated questions, uh, Ralph would uh, regress me and take me to the afterlife, and I would meet Jordan in a certain place, mm -hmm. and I could ask and get information. And in wow. this particular case. Uh, what Jordan told me was, well, remember that life we had together when, when you, you, we were in the yeshiva, in the yeshiva and, and I, I was the kind of the wise old rabbi, and you were this brash young uh, acolyte, and, uh, and, and after I died, uh, as the story would unfold, he, I can actually attempted to communicate with him uh, after death, and I was learning things from him that, con that contradicted uh, some, of the, some of what the learned... Uh, rabbis uh, believed about the Torah, mm -hmm. and I got myself in a lot of trouble. I see Shiva. where this is going. Yeah. And they thought I was crazy, and I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm talking to dead people, and I'm, you know, and, they, and not only that, the dead people are telling me the wrong thing. And so I'm, this was in another life. This was another life, yeah. in a yeshiva yeah. in the Middle Ages. Um, wow. And, uh, and so fast forward, you're concerned that people I'm going to be ostracized. Are going to think you're a fraud. And, and that I was picking up yeah. trauma from that life. Wow. And that, in fact, I was starting to do the very thing that had gotten me in trouble in that life, communicating with Jordan across the barrier right. of life and death. Right. And that I was going to end up, you know, thrown out of my profession. And, 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 and so did forth. any of that come true? Has anybody said, what, what are you doing? And this is not true. You know, what are you thinking of? No one has said that. Okay. And, in, and some of the people that I value who are colleagues and friends yeah. in the profession have actually been very generous and, uh, and, and appreciated uh, the book. So I, Has anyone ever come to you and said, you know what, I haven't ever told anyone this, but I've had similar experiences, or this has happened to me, but I haven't said it? Actually, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, in the, in the grief world, just in general, there's always been this, we used to jokingly say, woo-hoo people, yeah. who, yeah. Were, you know, who we thought were out there and who, you know, were doing into channeling or mediums or whatever, and then you had another side over here who may be there from their upbringing or their faith beliefs, you know, we're not open to it. But I think back then, you know, we whispered, people would whisper mm -hmm. behind, you know, some of the woohoo people and say they're a little out there. But the amazing part is, is as I began doing this work, and I traveled the country for 10 years uh, playing music, I'm a songwriter. And I think some of us came by what, what you're doing, but not through, you know, an educated way. But when, I, when Ashley died, I'm a songwriter, and um, I've written four CDs, 40 songs. But when I would write music, uh, when I wrote my first CD called Ashley's Songbook, I would have my dad drive me out to the desert and just drop me off mm -hmm. in the morning. And I said, I'll call you when I want you to come back. Wow. I didn't have a candle. I didn't have, but I did a lot of what you're talking about. I would sit there, and I would just think about Ashley. I, I wouldn't think about an automobile accident or even her death. I would focus on things that represented her life. Mm -hmm. And so as I look back at songs, a few weeks ago, I don't listen to my music. I spent a day listening to all four of my CDs. And I look back and I say, I did not write those songs. We wrote them together. There mm -hmm. are things in some of those songs that are almost cryptic. And I, and I think when people journal, 
I, I think people, if you're open to it, make that connection, not always knowing that that's exactly what they're doing. But I believe because that love is right there that I've met many, many people who don't say it out loud, but mm -hmm. to somebody like you would go, thank you for sharing your story because, as Gloria said, I've had an experience mm -hmm. like that. And I think we need to be open to it because what I found is people who've had those experiences, nobody could ever talk you out of them. It doesn't matter if the science proved otherwise when they, you've had them and they give you a sense of comfort. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful part about, about signs or hearing those voices is that they bring comfort to those who get them. And I think that's powerful. And the thing is that so many people are able to yes. communicate to the other side. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. For those people out there that are saying, okay, you know what I want? To, I want to make connection mm -hmm. with my child that died or my sibling that died or whoever in their life died. How, how would you start doing that? Like, what would be your advice to them? I think uh, the first thing I would do is, is, is really um, start to do channel writing or, or automatic writing. Mm -hmm. I, I find that it is there are really not there's not much in the way of barriers to mm -hmm. that. Um, now, how about your wife? You, I, I know that you said in the book sometimes that she had not had the same experience with Jordan that you've had. No, and she doesn't do uh, yeah. automatic or channeled writing, uh, and she has other ways of communicating with him that have to do with animals and birds. Mm -hmm. okay. and so when yeah. when uh, certain uh, birds that are present, mm -hmm. uh, she experiences his. Um, his spirit is there. Well, yeah. when they say birds are a way that people do communicate with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And dreams are another great way. Dream, dreams are another way. Yeah. You know, I think it's important to um, think about the fact that every, you know, people do have communication in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I liked your, um, that you've given such a clear description of what somebody can do if they want to start mm -hmm. the automatic writing. Get an item, find a, a place. A place that you feel safe mm -hmm. and grounded. I, I have a desk that my folks gave me when I was a kid so that I've had it for a long time and, and in that place I feel I feel a sense of my own history and mm -hmm. people that I love and yeah a place that grounded eye fixation the candle the object that connects you something that gets you into that that sense of receptivity mm -hmm. um, visualizing that that star of light over your mm -hmm. head and letting that grow into a kind okay. of a sun colored orb uh, and then just waiting till you feel uh, as you meditate, uh, that sense of receptivity. That I like the breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just focusing the on the breath, the in and the out of the breath. Thoughts come, but you don't get involved in them. Mm -hmm. you, you just yeah. return to the breath. You know, someone might just start if they're really um, nervous about it or whatever. You could really go into it uh, just practicing the breath for mm -hmm. a while and then maybe sitting with a candle, mm -hmm. you know. You wouldn't have to do the whole ball of wax at once, mm -hmm. and then maybe the next time thinking about that. And I, you certainly can do components of it. Although I think it's, I recommend people just go for it. All and, right. And, and 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 be sure to have something to write on, and I think that makes a big difference. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for being on the show yeah. today. It's been absolutely amazing, and I love that you've given people such a, a wonderful direction. And and thank you for having the risk in your life to come on and, and to talk about this. And thank you to Jordan yes. for bringing this to us. I agree with you. And who better than you to bring this message out there because you are a professional in the field. And I know that there's a lot of people that have had these experiences and haven't come forth with them. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And so make sure you get his book, Seeking Jordan. It's amazing. And we want to thank you for watching our show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours till you find your own. And God bless, and now we're going to hear from our good friend, Alan Peterson. Well, I cursed God and I cursed fate, I told everyone I couldn't wait till I could go. It turned me inside out and upside down. I could barely breathe or get around. It hurt me so. It took some time, but one day I knew I'd spend the rest of my life 
telling the world about you. Thanks for the hugs and all the kisses and your sweet laughter. Everybody misses. Thanks for the joy and the memories. I still cry. Cause it ain't easy But then again I have to smile Thanks for the little while Well I have learned it's up to me To give you a voice for the world to see So that's what I do Your love has been my guiding light, so I hold on to it tight. It helps me through. I had to let my anger go so I could let all my love for you show. Thanks for the hugs and all the kisses and your sweet laughter. Everybody misses Thanks for the joy And the memories I still cry Cause it ain't easy But then again I'll have to smile Thanks for the little while I had so much more love to give You had so much more life to live And in my dreams that's just how it would be Our story wasn't long enough But every page was filled with love And you will always be a part of me So I won't let tomorrow take away all the beauty we shared yesterday thanks for the hugs and your sweet kisses there's so much about you everybody misses thanks for the joy and the memories i'll always cry 